Well, hello again. I appreciate y'all coming to look at my channel and watch it on YouTube. I hope that you like. I hope that you like the stories about Hank the cow dog. But I want you to think about something. These stories that I'm reading are just part of a couple of the books. He's got over thirty of them. The fellow that wrote it, his name was John Erickson, and I told you before. He's from our part of the state. He, he grew up in the Texas Panhandle in a town called Perryton. It's, I know a lot about it because I, I was born in a place that was probably about a half hour drive from there. He worked on ranches all over the Texas Panhandle and over into New Mexico, made his living as a cowboy. And that's where he got the idea to have these stories about Hank the cow dog because he actually had a dog named Hank and he had another one and his name was Drover, just like the characters in the book. That's how you get famous is you just find a, a colorful way to express things that are happening to you in your life. Your life is important and you have the right to write down things and be creative about it. And now's a good time when everybody has to spend so much time inside the house. If you know how to read, or if you want to learn how to read better, have your mama find some of the books that was written by Mr. Erickson, and they're all about Hank the cow dog. Learn how to read it yourself. And when you're reading it, don't just struggle with the words. Start thinking about how he felt when he wrote it. That's what I do when I'm reading these stories. I try to make it sound like I was the one that wrote it. The next book that I'm going to read to you from is another Hank the Cow Dog. It's number 15 in the series. It's called The Case of the Missing Cat. Now, you know, several times before in that first book, we heard Hank talk about how he didn't like cats especially the one that lived with him there on the ranch. Well, that's who this one is about. It's called The Case of the Missing Cat. This is chapter one. The name of it is Pete's Con Game. <laughs> it's me again, Hank the Cow Dog. Have I ever mentioned that I don't like cats? <laughs> Seems like I just mentioned that a while ago. He said, I don't like cats. And the cat I don't like the most, the cat I dislike with my whole entire body and soul, is a certain selfish, sneaking, lazy, never-sweat character on my ranch named Pete the Barn Cat. You see, it was Pete who lured me into the case of the lumber pile bunny. He discussed this in a different book. We'll read it later. That was the straw that broke the camel's tooth and set my wicked mind to plotting ways of... And then his voice kind of trails off right there. He goes, hmm, how can I say this so that it doesn't sound crude and tacky? I decided, don't you see, that our ranch would be a happier and more wholesome place if Pete were suddenly to, uh, well, uh, vanish, you might say, without a trace. No clues, no suspects, no way that Sally Mae could connect me with the uh, tragedy. Hmm. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Better start at the beginning. It was mid-morning in the fall of the year, as I recall. I was making my way around the yard, around the fence, headed towards the front of the house when I encountered Pete the barn cat, and my trusty assistant, Mr. Half-Stepper, Mr. Sleep Till Noon, Mr. Look at the Clouds, Drover. They were sitting across from one another, looking down at the ground between them. Their behavior struck me as suspicious. I mean, at a distance of 10 or 12 feet, I could see that nothing on the ground was between them, nothing but dirt, that is. And why were they looking at dirt? Hmm, well, I put my primary mission on temporary hold, 
altered, of course, and went over to check this thing out. Number one, what's going on here? Number two, you're supposed to be resting up for night patrol, Grover. And number three, mingling, uh, mingling with cats is against regulations. Drover's head came up and he gave me his patently silly smile. Oh, hi, Hank. We're playing checkers. Playing checkers? I moved closer. Well, that's odd that you should say that, Drover, because I don't see either a checkerboard or checkers. Well, that's because we're playing checkerless checkers, aren't we, Pete? The cat grinned and nodded. Uh, that's right, Hanky. We're playing checkerless checkers. Want to play? Negative. Not only do I not want to play checkerless checkers, I don't believe there's any such a game. And if there is such a game, I refuse to play it. Period. Well, Pete shrugged and turned his attention to the ground. He moved his paw across the phony so-called checkerboard, tapping it in three different places. Sorry, Drover, but I just drunk, jumped three of your men. Drover squinted at the ground. Oh, darn. I guess I shouldn't have made that move. Did I lose another game? Pete nodded and grinned. Mm-hmm, you did. But, you better, but you're getting better all the time. You sure you don't want to play the winner, Hank? I pushed Drover aside and moved in closer. Okay, I've seen enough to know that there's something fishy going on here. Drover, where did you learn this so-called game? Well, let's see, uh, right here on the ranch. From who or whom did you learn it? Well, uh, let's see, uh, well, from Pete. In other words, your only knowledge of the rules is this so-called game that came from Pete. Is that correct? Uh, well, let's see. Uh, he squinted one eye and he rolled the other one around. How you do that? Squint one eye and roll the other one around. I can't do that. Well, I guess that's right, he said. I began pacing. Very good. Next question. Are you telling me that you can remember every move in a checker game? Well, I can't, but Pete can. Whew. Boy, he really is a sharp pencil, isn't he? Mm, 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 mm. Well... How do you know that? Well, he told me so. I see. I glanced from one face to the other. The pieces of the puzzle began falling into place. One more question, Drover, and I'll have this thing wrapped up. Which of you has won more games? Drover looked up at the sky. Uh, let's see. Pete won the first one, and Pete won the second one. But Pete won the fourth one, and then Pete won the fifth one. Hold it right there. You failed to mention who won the crucial third game. I think Pete won that one. Mm-hmm. Yes. You see what's going on here, don't you? I paced around the two of them. Drover watched me until his head went as far to the south as he could go without coming unscrewed. And at that point, he fell over backwards. Get up, Drover, and listen careful. I found a pattern here. He struggled back to a sitting position. Oh, good. Does it strike you as odd that Pete has won five out of five games? Did it ever occur to you that Pete might be cheating? Oh, heck no. We promised that we wouldn't cheat. Pete was still grinning and had begun to purr. Well, that's right, Hanky. We both promised not to cheat because cheating isn't nice. Suddenly, I stopped pacing and whirled around. It's all clear now, Drover, and I can tell you what's been going on. You've been duped. This cat lured you into a game you couldn't possibly win, and he's cheated you. But he promised. Never mind what he promised. Cats always cheat. You can write that down in your little book. I don't have a little book. Well, get one. I'm ashamed of you. Drover, only a chump would play checkerless checkers with a cat. Well, we had fun. 
Exactly, and having fun is one of the many things you're not allowed to do in the security business. Speaking of which, since you spent most of the morning goofing off, why don't you go down to the corrals and check things out? We can't play another game? That's correct, because I'm closing it down. This cat is through, finished. Oh, drat, I was just catching on. Go, and I'll expect a full report in 20 minutes. So little Drover went padding down towards the gas tanks. Then when he was gone, I turned to Pete. He was doodling around on the so-called checkerboard with his left front paw. His tail struck straight up in the air, and at the end of it was twitching back and forth. You know how them cats are. Pete, you ought to be ashamed of yourself taking advantage of a dunce. Why, it's hard to fool you, Hanky. Not just hard, Pete, impossible. I had your con game figured out the minute I walked up here. Playing checkers without checkers. I can't believe you talked the poor little mud into that. Well, you never know until you try. I studied the cat for a long time. Pete, there's a certain understanding between creeps like you and a dog like me. It's like cops and robbers. Only the cops know how good the robbers are in their shabby work, and only the robbers know how good the cops are. Well, that's right, Hanky. You understand me, and I understand you. Exactly. We're on opposite sides of the law. We're sworn enemies, and yet we can't help ad admiring each other's work. Mm-hmm. I learned a long time ago that I couldn't put anything over on the head of ranch security. Exactly. We'll never be friends, Pete. Fate is taking care of that. But in a crazy sort of way, he said, what are you doing? He had swept his paw over the so-called checkerboard, and now he appeared to be I wasn't sure what he was doing. Well, I'm through with the checker game. I know it won't work on you. Well, that's correct, but what are you doing? After the clearing board, after clearing the board of so-called checkers, he appeared to be setting it up again. He looked at me with his lazy, caddish eyes. I thought I might play a game of chess with myself. Chess? That's right. You've probably never heard of it. It's a very complicated game that requires concentration, and I couldn't help but smile. Pete, is it possible that you think I don't know about chess? The ancient game of war invented thousands of years ago by the Balonians, which requires cunning and intelligence. Hey, I've got bad news for you, cat. I know all about chess. Ask me anything. So the cat said, black or white? Huh? Would you rather play black or white? Oh, black, I suppose. It matches the color of my heart. All right, I'll open with pawn to king four. Oh, yeah? So I hunkered down and studied the board. Well, that doesn't scare me at all, cat. And I'll move this little phone out here. It's pawn, Hanky, not fawn. Whatever. There's my move. We didn't reap. Five minutes later, I was in deep trouble. I had lost three bishops one night, and my castle was in check. And at that very moment, I realized Drover was standing beside me. He stared at us. What are you doing? I looked at Drover, I looked at Pete, I looked down at the empty space of dirt between us. It occurred to me that I swept my paw across the so-called chessboard, erasing all traces of the so-called game. We were studying the dirt, Drover, talking soil samples, you might say, and, and what are you doing back so soon? Well, I just wanted to tell you that I saw a cottontail rabbit. He was eating grass right in front of our gunny sack beds. You're bothering me with a report about a rabbit? I'm a busy dog, Grover, and I got no time for... It was then I realized that Pete had disappeared. I glanced around and saw him creeping down the hill toward my cottontail rabbit. Hmm. What's he got on his mind? 
Well, that's chapter one. Here's chapter two. It's called Pete Makes a Foolish Wager. Woo, Pete's in trouble. I, it didn't take long. It didn't take me long to catch up with Pete. Hold it right there, cat. It appears to me that you're moving towards a certain cottontail rabbit. I should point out that the alleged rabbit belongs to me. Oh, really? I thought you were too busy for rabbits, Hank. I was misquoted. What I meant to say was that the rabbit belongs to me and you can keep your paws off of him. Now, Hanky, be reasonable. You don't have to you don't have any use for a rabbit. Oh yeah, says who? In the first place, he's not bothering anyone. He's just a cute, innocent little bunny eating grass. Yeah, but it's my grass, see, and he's down there by my gunny sack, and he doesn't have a permit to eat my grass in the vicinity of my gunny sack. Well, Pete grinned, and he licked his front paw with a long stroke of his tongue. And in the second place, it's a well-known fact that a dog can't catch a rabbit. I stared at the cat and began laughing. A dog can't catch a rabbit? Is that what you just said? Mm-hmm. Because a dog goes about it all the wrong way. Instead of being patient and stalking the rabbit as a cat would do, a dog just blunders in and starts chasing. Blunders in and starts chasing, huh? Go on, cat. I'm dying to hear the rest of this. Hmm, all right. And once the rabbit starts running, the game is over because a dog can't catch a rabbit on the run. That's a well-known fact. No, Pete, that's well-known garbage. Just the sort of half-truth and gossip that a cat would spread around. What you're saying is so outrageous that I refuse to discuss it anymore. Whatever you think, Hanky. Except to repeat what I've already said. Leave my rabbits alone. Now, if you'll excuse me, I've got... I bet you can't catch him. I've got two weeks' work lined up for... What did you just say? I bet you can't catch him. That ornery cat. I lowered my nose until it was only inches away from the cat's face. You want to bet me that I can't catch a sniveling little cottontail rabbit? On my ranch, when I'm head of ranch security? Mm-hmm. Well, my first thought was to meet his challenge head on, take him up on this foolish bet, and settle the matter once and for all. However, it was too easy. Something was wrong here. See, when you've worked around cats as much as I have, you develop a certain degree of caution. They're stupid animals, but they're stupid in a cunning sort of way. They have a talent for twisting things around. It's a minor talent. It doesn't compare at all with the larger and grander talents that you find in me or even in your average breed of dogs. But I'm talking about, oh, just to mention a few, good looks, high intelligence, courage, tremendous physical strength, good looks, speed, quickness, determination, endurance, and devilish good looks. Hmm. I must give Beulah the Collie most of the credit for spotting those qualities in me. You might say, Otherwise, I might never have known that they were there, which would have been a real shame. Where was I? <clears throat> Funny how Beulah seems to creep into my thoughts, but I was talking about something else, wasn't I? Seems to me, and, oh yes, cats. They have this minor talent for twisting things around, and over the years, I've learned that when a cat makes a simple statement or says something that appears on the surface to make sense, it's time to pull back and study the deal from a different perspective. I walked a short distance away and I switched over into heavy-duty analysis mode. Pete had just offered to make a foolish wager with me, one which he had no chance of winning. Now, why would a cat do such a thing? Answer number one. The cat is just dumb. 
and you must expect a dumb cat to make dumb mistakes. Answer number two. The cat is dumb, but not quite as dumb as he appears to be, in which case he should be approached with caution. Answer number three. The cat is actually pretty smart, and, well, I didn't need to follow this one out any farther because it was too outrageous to consider. I mean, this was the same cat who had invented a non-existent game called Checkerless Checkers, right? Nothing more needed to be said. And so having dismissed answer number three in record time, I ran answer number one and answer number two through my data banks. What the printout revealed was a conf confirmation of answer number one, which I had suspected all along. And that was that the cat is just dumb and you must expect a dumb cat to make dumb mistakes. That was what he figured was the reason. Pete had made a dumb mistake and had thrown down the goblet, so to speak, and challenged me to enter into a foolish wager. Foolish for Pete, that is. Okay, the only question left to ask was, would Hank the Cowdog consider taking an unfair advantage of a dumb cat? And I didn't need to run that one through the databanks. In a word, yes, I would, with all my heart and soul. Stealing glances as I paced back and forth, I studied the cat, measured him, sized him up, and prepared my next move. A strategy began to take shape in my mind, and at that point I was ready to respond. I swaggered back over to him. I said, okay, I'll take you up on your bet. Here's the deal, kitty, only if there's something at stake. Well, he looked up at me with his big cattish eyes and goes, Hmm, you mean something valuable? Exactly. I don't enter into bets with cats for my health. If you can't put up something that makes us deal worth my time and trouble, I'm not interested. My goodness, Hanky, you get pretty serious about these things, don't you? You got that right, cat. I'm a very busy dog and... Nickel and dime stuff doesn't interest me. Well, let me think. I'll bet you tonight's supper scraps. Not enough, he said. Well, then I'll throw in tomorrow's breakfast scraps, too. To be real blunt about it, Pete, scraps don't excite me right now. If we're going to bet... I want to bet something that really matters. Something that, if lost, will hurt bad. Mmm, that kind of a bet. I smirked and I gave him a worldly sideways glance. Now you understand, Pete. No penny ante here. This is go for broke. Do you want, do you want into the deal or do you want out? He studied his claws for a moment. I mean, the cat was obviously scared and stalling for time. All right, Hanky, if that's the way you want it, that's the way I want it. His eyes came up and he said, I'll bet your job as head of ranch security. Huh? My job as, now wait just a minute. Well, you wanted big stakes, right? You wanted to go for broke, right? Well, yeah, but... Well, there's the bet, he grinned, if you're dog enough to take it. My eyes narrowed and a growl began to rumble deep in my throat. Watch, you, watch what you say, cat. Your words could only come back to honk, honk you. And if your words don't honk you loud enough, I might consider doing a little bonk, honking of my own. Repeat the bet. I'm betting your job as head of ranch security that you can't catch that rabbit. My data bank's word. Let me get this straight. If I lose, you get my job as head of ranch security. But what are you putting up? What happens if you lose? Well, if I lose, you win the job as head of ranch security. We'll both be playing for the same prize. And if the prize is the same for both of us, it has to be a fair bet. 
I didn't like the way he was grinning, so I took the time to study the deal from every possible angle. It checked out. For the first time in years, this cat had offered a deal that was equal, fair, square, level, and plumb. All right, cat, you've got yourself a bet. It's a done deal, and there'll be no backing out. Wait a minute. Did he just let that cat talk him into betting a job that he already has? Oh, boy. Hank is really in trouble. You only get three tries, the cat said. Sure, fine. Don't bore me with the details. But what if you lose, Hanky? Will you pay off? I laughed. <laughs> That's not likely to happen, kitty. But if it does, I'll pay off. You've got my solemn cow dog oath on it. Hmm, and a cow dog never goes against his oath, right? Exactly, and now that you've committed yourself to the deal, I can reveal that you've made a very foolish blunder. Teed old buddy, old pal, you're fixing to lose it all on one roll of the dice. He gasped. Yes, he tried to hide it, but I saw him gasp. Hey, that cat was beginning to feel the jaws of my trap closing around him. All that remained was for me to hunker down and catch the rabbit. That would be a nice piece of cake for this old dog. I mean, catching rabbits was no big deal for me just by George run them down and snatch them up in the old iron jaws. Yes, sir, and when that happened, fellers, Pete the barn cat would be out of luck and out of business. Well, I'll read you one more chapter here. This is chapter number three, and it's called The Case of the Lumber Pile Bunny. Remember, we referred to this before. As you might expect, old Pete was shaking in his tracks, and we're talking about worried, sick, and scared to death. I guess he'd finally figured out that he'd bet his entire future on this deal and that his chances of winning had come down to slim and none. Slim chances, not Slim the cowboy. There are several Slims around here, don't you see? That's a popular name, name against cowboys. Anyways, I headed down to the gas tanks to find the lumber pile bunny. Did I mention where he got his name? Maybe not. Okay, well, here we go. One of my jobs on the ranch was to identify and track the movements of every rabbit within the perimeter of ranch headquarters. At that particular time, I was following the movements of three alleged rabbits, the one we call the Cake House Bunny. He stayed underneath the Cake House. The Cattle Guard Bunny, who lived in the Cattle Guard just north of headquarters, and the Lumber Pile Bunny. I knew them all on sight. I had memorized their markings and habits and had been keeping all of them under pretty close surveillance for months and months. How could one dog keep track of three rabbits at the same time? Well, you might ask that. Good question. All I can say is that I did it. A lot of dogs would have found it difficult, if not impossible. But for me, it was just part of the job. The next thing you're probably asking yourself is, where did Lumber Pile Bunny get his name? Another good question. I had assigned the code name Lumber Pile Bunny to this particular rabbit because... Well, because he lived in a lumber pile, and maybe that was fairly obvious. But there was nothing obvious about where the lumber pile came from. Here's the scoop on that. Back in the spring, the cowboys became so embarrassed by the appearance of their corral fence that they took the drastic step of replacing 20 or 30 rotten, warped, moth-eaten boards with new lumber. Anytime those guys give up on using the baling wire patch, the action can be regarded as drastic. Yes, they did in fact replace the old boards with new boards, but did they haul off the old boards? No, sir. Throwed them in a pile on the west side and drove away saying, we'll haul that lumber off when we get caught up with some of this other work. But did they? No, sir. That's a pretty sorry way to run a ranch, seems to me. But did anyone ask the opinion of the head of ranch security? Again, no, I'll say no more about it. That's a pretty sorry way to run a ranch. Except that lumber piles attract rattlesnakes and skunks and provide a place of refuge for sniveling little rabbits. Speaking of whom, 
Would you care to guess who took up residence in the lumber pile? That is correct. A certain cottontail rabbit to whom or whom I assigned the code name Lumber Pile Bunny. This was the guy I was after. Okay, some 10 feet north of the gas tanks, I throttled back to a slow gliding walk, switched my ears over to manual lift up, began testing the air with full nosatory equipment, and directed my VSDs, that's visual scanning devices, in ordinary dogs also referred to as eyes, toward a patch of grass directly west of the gas tanks. This procedure soon bored, soon bored fruit, bared, produced results. You know what I mean. As my instruments began picking up the telltale sounds of a rabbit munching grass, it was the lumber pile bunny. <laughs> he was munching tender shoots of grass some 25 or 30 feet to the west of my bedroom. The foolish rabbit seemed unaware that he had entered a secured area and that the dark shadow of doom was slipping towards him like a dark shadow in the night. Well, maybe not in the night. You wouldn't be able to see a dog. You wouldn't be able to see a dark shadow in the... Well, anyhow. Even though I had switched over to silent mode, the burn, bunny heard me coming. They have pretty good ears, don't you know, and it's hard to slip up on one. But get this, instead of running away, he stood up on his back legs, looked straight at me, and wiggled his nose in what I would describe as a provocative gesture. Hmm. Okay, what we had here was a rabbit who had never been taught his place on the ranch, or else one that had lost his mind. He wanted, he wanted to play with fire, and so he was fixing to learn about fire. Well, this was it. I glanced back to the to be sure that Pete was watching. He was. I took a deep breath and I rolled my shoulders several times to loosen up the enormous muscles that would soon propel me at speeds unknown to ordinary dogs. I turned back to the rabbit, looked in all guidance, locked in all guidance systems, and began the countdown procedure, which goes something like this in case you're not familiar with technical stuff. Five, four, three, two, one. Launch, lift off, charge, bonsai. And in a puff of smoke and a cloud of dust, I went streaking towards the target. Rabbits are famous for their speed, right? But what many people don't know is that your better grades of cow dog are every bit as fast as a rabbit. And in a few rare cases, me, for example, are even faster. I'm not one to boast, but speed was just built into my bloodline. In other words, the lumber pile bunny was in big trouble from the very beginning. I closed in on, closed in on him fast and was only inches away from snapping him up in my jaws when, well, let's call it luck. He got lucky, that's all. And why not? After all, he is carrying around four lucky rabbit's feet. He's a lucky rabbit. Luck kept him a couple of feet ahead of me as we went streaking out into the home pasture. Inches, actually. We made a wide loop some 25 yards in front of the corrals, and then I realized that Bunny had changed direction and was highballing it straight to the lumber pile. It was an old rabbit trick. I recognized it right away and took appropriate measures. I went to incredible speed, and like I said, he was carrying four lucky rabbit's feet. I never denied that rabbits are pretty swift, and okay, maybe he beat me to the lumber pile, but not by much. If the chase had gone on another ten feet, I would have had him. I returned to the gas tanks to wait for him to come out again, as I knew he would. Off to the north, I heard a familiar whiny voice say, Hmm, that's one hanky. Don't worry about it, kitty. That was just a warm-up. I waited, and I waited. The minutes dragged by. Perhaps I dozed off a little bit. Then the munching of grass reached my ears. He was back. Same place. Munching grass right in front of my bedroom. That foolish rabbit. 
when within seconds I had gone through the launch procedure and was back on the chase. You should have seen me. Made that loop out into the pasture and virtually destroyed three acres of good buffalo grass and virtually had that bunny trapped in the deadly vice of my jaws. And if the chase had gone on another five feet, that little feller would have been a statistic. Or statistic. He's not real sure how to say it. History. Real close race. Almost got him. A huge improvement over the first one. And as long as a guy can see improvement, he knows that he's won a moral victory. And so, with the victory hanging in the trophy room of my mind, I returned triumphant and victorious to the gas tanks. A little winded, yes, but beneath the huffing and puffing was the warm glow of satisfaction that comes when a dog knows he's done his job right. Hmm, that's two, Hanky, said the cat. Only one shot left. I chuckled and I didn't bother to reply. I knew what the cat was trying to do, put pressure on me so that I would choke. What he didn't know was that some dogs thrive on pressure. I mean, it's like throwing gasoline into a <laughs> choke gas park. On the other hand, I was beginning to feel a small amount of, I mean, my job, my position. My entire career was riding on the next wheeze, oh, gasp. Holy smokes, if I didn't catch a rabbit on the next run, Pete the barn cat would be the next head of ranch security. Not only would that be a personal disaster for me, personally, but it would be disaster for the whole entire ranch. Gulp. Pressure. It weighs heavy on the mind. Smashes creative impulse. Crushes the little flowers of courage that try to bloom in the warm soil of something. I was curled up in a ball in the process of pretending that I was a puppy again. Back in the sweet days before I had assumed all of the crushing responsibility of running a ranch, when all of a sudden I lifted my eyes and narrowed my head, lifted my head and narrowed my eyes, I should say, and there sat the lumber pile pony, not Ten feet in front of me. Okay, this was it. My whole career had come down to this moment, this last chase. I arose from my gunny sack bed and I prepared myself for what was sure to be the most important mission of my life. Well, that's the first three chapters. The next time, I'll start with number four. Chapter number four is called the bunny cheats and lies. I think Hank's not going to do too good against this cat. The cat's pretty smart. Well, I'm going to read some more tomorrow, but this is all I'm going to read right now. I'm glad y'all listening. Remember, you can go get these books from the library and read them yourself. And when you read them, you can try to talk like whatever kind of character you want it to be. Would you like it to be someone very serious? Or you can talk like a country boy like me. I think that that's the way the fella had it in mind when he wrote them. I'm going to let you go for now. Stay safe. Tell your mom and daddy that you love them. Thank you for watching. <laughs>